Shalom Havarim, <clears throat> James Trim here, and uh, today I want to answer some of the many questions that we've gotten concerning the oral law, what's called oral Torah or oral law. And uh, this has come up from a number of videos we've done in the, uh, the recent past on the origin of the uh, Kairites <clears throat> and uh, how baptism is oral law, etc. And so I want to talk to you today just about uh, the oral law in general and, and, and respond to some of the questions and comments that we've gotten. Um, before we get going, I need to ask people to please donate to support these videos. Uh, I think you'll find that we have unique material that you won't find anywhere else. Um, uh, not that any one topic you might not find somewhere else, but overall, a lot of our material is, is unique uh, uh, and on a, I would even say, a higher level than a lot of the material that you'll find elsewhere. So uh, donations have been recently low, and so uh, uh, we are actually getting very, very low financially and uh, we're going to be in some real problems very soon so i need you to please if you can donate to support these videos the blogs and um, our groceries <laughs> okay um, you can donate by sending donations to the donate link in the video description uh, you can also donate by uh, sending donations by paypal to donations at wnae.org. All right, and uh, the uh, uh, also there are uh, handouts that you can follow along, and there's a, a PDF file uh, link to those handouts also in the video description, so you can uh, uh, download that PDF file and follow along with some of the. Uh, uh, sources that we are citing in this video. I uh, want to ask everybody to please like the video. Uh, please subscribe to our channel. Click that little bell icon so you'll get notifications when new videos come out. Let us know what you think of our videos in the comments. Participate in the discussions in the comments section. All of these things are things that the YouTube um, algorithm looks at to decide which videos to recommend to new users and we'd like to get recommended to new users so you also would like you to ask you to please share these videos on social media on Facebook Twitter etc uh, with your friends on social media so that we can also get exposed to new viewers and uh, like I said subscribe we're trying to build our subscriber base we're up over 3,000 subscribers now but we're working towards uh, 3,500 and so uh, uh, and ultimately 4,000 so please help us uh, build our subscriber numbers by subscribing to the video okay um, to the channel all right let's uh, uh, look at the first page for our handouts and uh, we have a quotation from the first century Jewish writer Flavius Josephus in his book Antiquities of the Jews book 13 chapter 11 section 6 uh, talking about the Pharisees he says the Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers which are not written in the law of Moses then he writes concerning the Sadducees and we'll do a whole video in the future on the origin of the Sadducees and who the Sadducees were um, but it's important to know that the Sadducees were an apostate group they did not believe that there was an afterlife or a resurrection <clears throat> and as a result of that they had to reject uh, Jewish traditions because Traditionally, Judaism has always believed in an afterlife and a resurrection, also scripturally, but it was hard enough <clears throat> for the Sadducees to square their apostate beliefs 
with the written Torah and impossible to go to square it with the oral Torah, with the uh, oral understanding of the written Torah that had always existed in Judaism. So they had to reject the oral law. And so Josephus writes about them. He says, for that reason, it is that the Sadducees rejected them and say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to uh, we are uh, not to observe what are delivered from the traditions of our forefathers. Okay, so the Sadducees rejected these oral laws. Now, Josephus doesn't mention this, but it's clear from our uh, knowledge of them that the Essenes didn't reject the oral law. They actually had an even stricter interpretation, a stricter oral law than the Pharisees did, but they didn't reject the idea of oral law either. Uh, it was only the Sadducees that rejected the oral law. Centuries later, the Karaites would reject the oral law, but they didn't originate, originate until the Middle Ages. We did a whole video on, the, on them in the past. Uh, but there were no Karaites in Yeshua's day. Yeshua wasn't a Karaite because there was no such thing. Okay, there's two kinds of oral law. You know, people ask me about the oral law. A lot of uh, people that have a problem with the oral law have misconceptions of what the oral law is. So there are two types of oral law or two different things that are fall in the category of oral law. The first of these is oral Torah from Sinai. And the second of them, which we'll cover in a minute, are the decrees of the elders. Okay, but let's talk about the oral Torah from Sinai. So when Moshe was on Mount Sinai for 40 days, he received the Torah. And the, uh, he certainly, in 40 days, received more than we have in our written Torah. How do we know? Uh, get uh, books on tape. Get a, you know, uh, uh, Alexander Scorby's reading of the, the Bible, for example, and get the first five books of Moses and just play the tapes. And uh, the, uh, uh, the Torah can simply be verbally delivered uh, in <clears throat> uh, probably five hours, maybe less, certainly uh, less, less than a full day. 40 days, absolutely unnecessary. So, uh, uh, should, I'm sorry, Moshe must have received a whole lot more material than we have in the written Torah if he was receiving material for 40 days. Um, also, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 46 says that Moses received, quote, laws in the plural on Mount Sinai. So he received... The Torah Shebi Katav, the written Torah, and the Torah She Al Peh, the oral Torah. Um, for example, the written Torah says not to go out of one's place on the Shabbat. What does that mean? What does it mean not to go out of one's place on the Shabbat? Um, does it mean that if I'm uh, in my home when the Sabbath starts and I need to go to the latrine or the outhouse, as we would say, um, does that mean I can't go out to the outhouse until the Sabbath is over? If I'm in the outhouse, in the latrine, when the Sabbath starts, does that mean I can't go back to my house and go into the back into the house until Sabbath is over? Um, what does not going out of one's place mean? Uh, does it mean my house, my yard, my city? Uh, what does it mean? Well, the oral Torah gives us that information, but the written Torah alone does not. Uh, so when Moshe comes down with the Torah from Mount Sinai and delivers the Torah to the people, and little Shlomo on the front row raises his hand and Moshe says, you know, not, do not go out of your place on Shabbat. And Shlomo says, what does that mean? 
not to go out of my place on Shabbat? Moshe did not shrug his shoulders and say, heck if I know. He'd been on Mount Sinai for 40 days learning all of these things. So he was able to answer Shlomo, and Shlomo was then able to teach his children, and his children were able to teach their children, uh, as Josephus describes, delivered by our fathers, in other words, from generation to generation, uh, to this very day. It is described in the scriptures, in Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 through 4. Give ear, my people, to my Torah. What? Ear? To my Torah? That sounds like something that's oral. Give ear, my people, to my Torah. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Remember, it's called uh, Torah uh, I'll pay from concerning the mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, showing to the generation to come the praises of Yahweh and his strength and his wonderful works, that he has done. So Psalm 78 verses 1 through 4 describes a process whereby Torah is passed verbally from Elohim to the people of Israel and within the people of Israel from generation to generation, from one generation to the next verbally. So there's an oral companion to the written Torah. Let's look at another example of, uh, of uh, oral Torah from Sinai. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21. And uh, this is a passage, in fact, uh, let me look this up. Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21 says, And if the place which Yahweh your Elohim has chosen to put his name there to be too far from you, in other words, the temple, if the temple's too far from you, then you shall kill of your herd and your flock, which Yahweh has given you, as I have commanded you. Literally, in the Hebrew, like I have commanded you. And you shall eat in your gates whatsoever your soul lusts after. Okay, so what this is saying, what this is saying is if you get hungry for a hamburger and you live too far from the temple to have the ritual slaughter done there, you can slaughter the animal yourself at home, more or less, okay, at your own farm, ranch, whatever. You can slaughter the animal yourself. Uh, as long as you do it in the manner which Elohim has prescribed. Here's the thing, the problem is that nowhere in the Torah is there the, a prescribed manner for slaughtering an animal. That is found in the oral Torah, and it can be found in the Talmud in Tractate Hulin, uh, and the Mishnah and, and Talmud in Tractate Hulin, and uh, the Tosefta. And what I want, want to, should say here, one of the questions I get asked is, is the Talmud the oral law? No. Uh, was the oral law codified as the Talmud? No. The Talmud contains the oral law. The Talmud is not necessarily, it contains many other things as well. And as I said, there's more than one kind of oral Torah. We're going to address that nuance later. But the, uh, the and you can find in Tractate Tulin, the, the method for slaughtering an animal, but you won't find it anywhere in the written Torah, even though the written Torah does say that Elohim did give a prescribed method for uh, slaughtering an animal and that we're to follow that method even if we do it at home instead of at the temple. There are a lot of other examples um, that we could give. What does it mean not to work on the Shabbat? Uh, we may do a whole, I don't know if we did a video on that in the past, we may do one in the future at some point. <clears throat> what constitutes work? Uh, because one person will, you know, if it's just up to personal preference, one person will say, hey, man, I enjoy 
uh, doing a certain thing on the Sabbath. Another, but does that make it not work? You know, so uh, I, maybe I enjoy uh, working out. Do I do that on the Sabbath? Uh, maybe I enjoy building things. Maybe I enjoy carpentry. Do I engage in carpentry on the Sabbath? Uh, just because I enjoy it, does that make it not work? And uh, and so on. Okay, another thing talks about giving a bill of divorcement in Deuteronomy chapter 24, uh, and uh, starting in verse 1. But what constitutes a bill of divorcement? What does it have to say? Um, you know, so... There's just not enough information in the written Torah to observe Torah. And um, so there's a lot of things the, uh, that we uh, know are part of what's called oral Torah from Sinai that were necessary to observe Torah from day one. You couldn't observe Torah without this knowledge that was oral Torah from Sinai. We also have a number of things that have been passed down to us it's too much to go into here, but one example, just one example of things that are oral Torah from Sinai is the water libation ceremony at Sukkot, which Yeshua is referencing in uh, uh, Yochanan, uh, either chapter 7 or 8, and uh, uh, we may do a whole video on that at Sukkot, uh, but uh, uh, this is... Uh, uh, oral Torah from Sinai. Okay. The other kind of oral Torah, we said there were two. The other kind of oral Torah is the decrees of the elders. Um, the elders are said to have ha had halakhic authority. Halakhic authority is the authority to make halakhic determinations. What is halakhic? Halakha, <coughs> excuse me, halakha is means basically it comes from the root to walk or to go and it means the way to walk or the way to go the way we carry out things in judaism okay how to observe torah in other words uh and so the the uh torah tells us that if um it, it requires us in deuteronomy 16 verse 8 18 sorry to establish courts and one of the things that we're told about these courts and there's a whole lot more information about this in the handout. But it, uh, so read and study the material in the handout, but we're going to keep it real simple right now. And that is uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, we are told, let me turn to that right here. Deuteronomy chapter 17. We are told, actually, chapter 16. No, no, chapter 16 is where it starts to talk about judges. Okay, so uh, chapter 16, verse 18 says, Judges and officers shall you make you in all your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Okay, and then um, I'm going to skip down to chapter 17, verse 1, um, actually verse 2. If there be found among you within any of your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, man or woman that has wrought wickedness in the sight of Yahweh your Elohim in transgression of, uh, uh, transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon, or any of the other of uh, the heavens which I have commanded and it be told you and you have heard it and inquired diligently and beheld uh, it be true that certain things which abomination is wrought in Israel um, in verse 5 then shall you bring forth that man or that woman which has committed that wicked thing onto your gates even that man or that woman and shall, atone, shall stone them with stones till they die. Verse 6. At the mouth of two... At the, uh, at the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. 
but as the mouth of one witness shall not be put to death. Um, and there's other pa another passage that tells us that a matter is, is established based in Torah based upon the testimony of at least two witnesses. Verse 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put uh, him to death, and afterwards the hands of the people, so you shall put the evil away from among you. Uh, so the two witnesses actually had to initiate an execution if it was a capital crime. If there arise, a, verse 8, very important starting in verse 8, if there arise a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within your gates, then shall you arise and get you up onto the place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. And you shall come onto the priests, the Levites, and onto the judges that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show you the sentence of judgment. And you shall do, verse 10, very important, and you shall do according to the sentence which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show you, and you shall observe to do according to all that they inform you. Verse 11, according to the sentence of the Torah which they shall teach you, and according to the judgment which they shall tell you, you shall do, you shall not decline from the sentence which they shall show you to the right hand nor to the left. I'm just going to stop there. You can read on, but the verse 11, the key, key phrase here, according to the sentence of the Torah. So the rulings of this, of the judges that shall be in those days that serve in this halachic body, that make these halachic decisions in matters of controversy according to the written Torah are also Torah. They're called Torah in verse 11. Okay? They are extensions of written Torah and they are similar to what we call or what we have in our system of, of court precedents, common law, or court precedents where the court makes a ruling and that ruling becomes law, okay? Uh, effectively becomes law because it becomes interpretation of law. That's the American system and several countries have similar systems. But uh, uh, what I'm getting at here is that in the Torah, the Torah courts, which are we're required in chapter 16 to establish by the way, that their rulings become Torah. And so those are also a type of oral Torah that are passed from generation to generation. So what are some examples of this? Is found, and uh, we covered this in detail in the uh, uh, Talmud for Beginners uh, number one video uh, several years ago. Uh, and we also covered it in the Traditions of Men video recently. Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, uh, the, the issue comes up of, the, of what happens when you have, on the one hand, you have a Torah command that says you shall keep all of your vows. And there's another Torah commandment that says honor your mother and your father. So what happens if one has made a vow, the keeping of which would not, would dishonor mother or father? Which commandment do I keep? Do I keep the vow and thus dishonor my parents? Or do I honor my parents and thus violate the vow? And Yeshua settles the issue in Matthew chapter 15 and uh, makes, and, and uh, there's an, a halakhic ruling there. And likewise, uh, in Nedarim 9.1, in the Mishnah, we also read the same solution to the problem. Okay. So the, uh, um, we're going to do another video in the future, on, uh, in the near future, in fact, on Yeshua and the halakhic authority of the ancient Nazarene Sanhedrin. Okay? Uh, we'll do a video very soon on that.
But let's talk about oral Torah as far as Nazarenes go, because, as they say, it's complicated. So, uh, how should Nazarenes relate to oral Torah? As I understand it, here is my view. Obviously, oral Torah from Sinai, we should observe, just like oral Torah, and just like written Torah from Sinai. Um, so, we should do such things as the water libation ceremony, uh, etc. Unfortunately, uh, many of you are not necessarily adequately uh, schooled in, under, in, in uh, the knowledge of which of the traditions are from Sinai. And I might write up some things on that in the future. It's a lot of material to put together, but um, is, uh, somebody that's qualified to do it needs to do it and so maybe that falls to me to, to do at some point here in the near future or in the future. The other kind of, t of oral Torah we said were the decrees of the elders and that's where it gets more complicated because uh, we have the issue of uh, decrees of the elders that were made prior to the time of Yeshua versus decrees of the elders that were made after the time of Yeshua by, uh, in rabbinic Judaism, by halakhic authorities that rejected Yeshua and that I would argue were not binding. In fact, in the future video, we will show that Yeshua established the, uh, a, a, a unique Nazarene halakhic authority that was apart from that of rabbinic Judaism from that point forward. And we see that body meeting in Acts chapter 15, for example. And so, um, uh, should, so Nazarenes, I believe, should observe uh, as Torah judgments of the elders that were made prior to the time of Yeshua. Which ones were those? Well, again, that's something I may have to compile together because some qualified person needs to do it. And um, uh, unfortunately, you know, there's there's not a lot of people that A, are uh, qualified to do it and B, are inclined to do it. Um, so we need to differentiate the decrees of the elders from before the time of Yeshua from those after the time of Yeshua. So now let's talk about those after the time of Yeshua. So first thing, two things we've covered is oral Torah from Sinai. I believe we should be observing oral Torah from Sinai, just like written Torah from Sinai. Okay. Uh, judgments of the elders prior to the time of Yeshua. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I, I think we should be observing judgments of the elders from the period before the time of Yeshua. Okay. So judgments of the elders after the time of Yeshua. Well, we shouldn't reject those out of hand, in my opinion. Okay, so let me draw an analogy because we gave the analogy early of, of uh, legal precedence. Okay, like uh, common law and, and a legal precedence in our modern legal system, at least in the United, in the United States, in the UK, I believe, and uh, other, other countries that have uh, systems, especially those based on uh, British common law. Okay. So we have uh, uh, court precedents. In um, the United States, we have different jurisdictions, and many of those jurisdictions are co-equal, okay, and therefore not applicable to one another. So um, if a matter arises in a certain jurisdiction, and there's a, uh, uh, a, a civil case taking place in jurisdiction A, and a similar case has taken place and was settled in jurisdiction B, in a different jurisdiction. It doesn't necessarily mean that we throw away the, juris the, uh, court, the results of the court case in jurisdiction B. We, it's not binding, okay, but it'd be perfectly appropriate 
to for the attorneys involved and maybe even the court clerks involved to look at that uh, ruling and look at the arguments that were made that are uh, and determine whether they are pertinent to the law in the uh, other jurisdiction in you know jurisdiction A to determine if the the uh, reasoning and results of what happened in jurisdiction B are pertinent to jurisdiction A and take them under advisement and consider them. In fact, it would be unwise not to at least look at that and look and see what arguments were made in jurisdiction B and consider them and are uh, uh, tried, you know, for the, at least the lawyers involved in arguing the case back and forth in jurisdiction A, to look at those arguments and to make the same arguments and uh, uh, determine the applicability in jurisdiction A. Okay, I think we should be doing the same thing with or with the decrees of the elders that occurred in rabbinic Judaism after the time of Yeshua. We shouldn't dismiss them out of hand because they're rabbinic Judaism after the time of Yeshua. We should intelligently examine them and look, and this is the beautiful thing about the Talmud, the Talmud records minority and majority opinions. It includes the dynamic arguments that are taking place. It doesn't just give you the result. It, uh, like the Supreme Court record and, and uh, other court records, it records the debates and discussions that went back and forth, the minority opinions that may have ultimately been rejected. And in some cases, it even turns around and says the matter is as yet unresolved. And in the future of Nazarene Judaism, it is my my hope that we are able to have educated uh, yeshiva student type Nazarenes that are uh, that understand how the Talmud works and can examine those arguments in light of the teachings of Yeshua and the emissaries and uh, our knowledge of. Uh, the other side of our family, if you will, in Essene Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and um, uh, what we know of Second Temple era Judaism, and determine their applicability for us as Nazarenes as to whether they should be kept or not. That's a long process. That's a deep held process. It's an in-depth process. It should be done. But the people that can do it, I don't believe exist right now. Um, and uh, uh, a body of people that could do it, I don't believe. I've been pressed by people, more than one person, to establish a full-blown 70-member Nazarene Sanhedrin. And we will talk in the future, or reestablish, we'll talk in the future in a future video about how the ancient Nazarene uh, Sanhedrin system functioned. We have some pretty good information about that. Um, but um, I don't believe that we have enough qualified individuals that know how to study Talmud and know how to scrutinize these arguments um, and then apply them in light of the Ketuvim Netzarim, the writings of the Nazarenes, etc., to, as a body to make those it, it should be done it needs to be done but I think it's a project for the future and I hope that it's something that can happen in my lifetime I have been in the process of writing up my own halakhic opinions about these things but I'm not a body of 70 individuals I'm just the, this one guy um, and uh, we need more people that are um, uh, schooled in the rabbinic literature and know the Talmud, know Talmudic arguments, and know how to analyze Talmud. And maybe we'll have the opportunity to uh, 
create a yeshiva to, to bring up those kinds of people in the future. But I digress. So this is uh, the two types of oral Torah and the three types of responses Nazarenes should have to the oral Torah. And it's a process. Uh, it's complicated and it's a process. And the third uh, category that we've spoken of, uh, oral Torah, well, first of all, we need qualified people that can determine that know uh, the, uh, the Talmud and the rabbinic literature enough to isolate and uh, uh, yeah, to isolate and codify oral Torah from Sinai. And then to isolate and codify oral Torah uh, decrees of the elders that took place before the time of Yeshua. And then to categorize the third grouping, uh, those that are after, which is the largest grouping, those that happen after the time of Yeshua, and that then are qualified to analyze those arguments that are made in the Talmud for and against and about those halachic rulings and um, uh, make appropriate Nazarene rulings based upon our understanding of the teachings of Yeshua and the emissaries uh, and the uh, applicability and and uh, make Nazarene halacha that uh, that would uh, be parallel to rabbinic halacha on those issues. This is my opinion. This is my view. You may not agree. Let me know what you think in the comments. And um, please donate to support this work. Uh, we need your donations now more than ever. And uh, you can do that by clicking on the donate link in the video description or by sending donations by PayPal to donations at wnae.org. And um, please like this video. Uh, please subscribe to this channel. Click that uh, bell, that notification bell, so you get notified of new videos. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments and participate in the discussions in the comments section. Share these videos with your friends on social media. And uh, until next time, shalom everybody.